Have you counted the cost? There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord, where the call of his spirit is lost. And you hurry along with the pleasure mat throne. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost?
come into us to pray and say, Father, please help me tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. That we not cross the line beyond redemption in Jesus' mighty name. That as you call men into yourself, as you call the whole world to your own, to yourselves. Lord, I will not miss the call in Jesus' mighty name. I will not cross beyond the line of redemption. I will not cross to a line of no return. In the mighty name of Jesus, please help me tonight. Speak to my heart and speak to my heart. Speak to my life. Let your word bring a last and perpetual change in me. In the mighty name of Jesus, help me by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And so, Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you because you have already started with us. Lord, by reason of this teaching, you will bring revival to our lives. And to our heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Is there any line we are following that we are already crossing beyond your reach? Lord, tonight, draw us back to yourself in Jesus' mighty name. Blessed be your holy name. As many of us on their way, please cook in their footsteps. That at the end of today, everyone in this meeting, both now and those that will join us, you will have half reason to bless you that we came. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Speak to us expressly. And give us the grace and the power to do your will. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Can I please be seated? God bless you. Thank you for coming. Once again, I want to thank God for bringing all this way. And this far into this teaching. As we continue in the parable of Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God tonight, we'll be discussing the parable of the fishing net. Or what otherwise call the parable or the drag net, the net that collects so much fish. The fisherman has a big net that they lay like a trap inside the sea, and it will collect all kinds of fish, numerous in this number. It can collect so much like the one Jesus Christ had uh, helped Peter to collect, that even the boat couldn't carry it. Because it was so big that it began to sink. So the parable that the Jesus Christ told in line with that kind of fishing net is what we are discussing tonight. Along with the other parable we are discussing in Matthew chapter 13. It's a chapter full up of so many, many parables. About eight of them. And I think it should be the last of that, um, the second to the last of the parable that Jesus Christ told in this particular chapter. And we are seeing chapter 13 of Matthew from verse 47 to 50 as we consider the parable of the fishing net. The parable of the fishing net. Can you say it together? The parable of the fishing net. Matthew 13, 47 to 50. I read from here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net. He has been talking and Describing the kingdom of heaven to different, different kind of things. And as Jesus will do it, he used to use things that are familiar with his audience, things that are common to the audience of the time. And by so doing, even now, a thing that's actually common to us, he tells us, see, the farmer sow, he told of trees, he told of uh, farmers that went to sow, and he of fishes, and so many things, even water, things that are common to the time, even soil, different kind of soil in this same chapter. So he told of different things that his audience are used to, that are common to, that are in their time as at that time. Even though we are even though that are reading now, we know these are things that are common knowledge that we, we can easily see and we can easily relate to it even today. Take for example the one we are talking about tonight, the parable of a fishing net. There is no country or really a country we are, this is not um, seen. If you have not been to a river before or water before, we are the sea fishermen catching, using net, catching fish in their net. At least must have seen it on television or read about it in books. So there are things that are quite common to every day to day activity of man. So for seven, say again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net, a fishing net that was cast into the sea. Mind you, it was into the sea, not just a river or a lake, but into the sea. This man was maximizing his reach. He was casting his net into the sea. And for a man to be fishing in the sea, it means he's fishing in a very big river, I mean very big water. Not just a small river, 
not just a small lake, not just a small water, but a sea, which means the man must be well prepared. It must be well settled. It must be well, must have considered the benefit and the risk of going into the high sea. First and foremost, it must have understanding of the water in which you want to go and uh, fish. And because I understand that water, I want to go and fish. Once it's going to the water, it's going prepared. It must not be a novice, lest himself will not return from his fishing trip. Because it's not just a small river, it's a big sea. And therefore, he must be going prepared, having a good understanding of what it's going to do on the sea. And once on the sea, before going to a must test, and realize and consider the net is going to, to use, which is the star of our topic today, the parable of the fishing net, the drag net that will drag so many fish along with itself and bring them to shore. So the man going there must first of all look at the net and consider the reliability of his net, that the net is worthy of the job it's going to do. If we consider it, if we take his time, if we go through the net, a big net, it can be as big as this as a church, even bigger sometimes. The man will take time, we going through the net, hole by hole, thread by thread, to be sure the net do not have a leaking point, a loophole, through which the fish or whatever is able to catch on the high sea, it will have opportunity to escape. Less he waste his time, less he waste his opportunity, less he work and engage in fishing for vain. So it will take time to look at the holes, to look at the bo- at, at each thread and be sure none of them is broken. Because a good fisherman know, a good fisherman will know this that the strong the strongness, the ability to withstand stress of a net depend on its weakest point. Just like a chain, the ability of a chain, the strength of a chain depends on its weakest position. So once the enemy discover this place is weak, then they use that place to escape. So the man will make sure that the net is well used and the net does not have a loophole or a place where it can, the things can begin to escape. So if all of you sit set down and look at it and check the liability, the reliability of its net and make sure and be sure that the net does not have a loophole through which its fish or its catch can escape less a war in vain. You know, sometimes they never look for a loophole, for a weak point, and that's why every one of us must be strong at our feet in our little corner, we are doing our best to do. Let me get one of those things. We are doing our best to make the best use of whatever the Lord has put now in our hand. In number. In um, Deuteronomy 20, 25, let's see that place, Deuteronomy 25, because the enemy always look forward to our weak point. And if that weak point is not materialized, it's not used, it's not strengthened, then it can be our Achilles leg. It can be the point through which the enemy will strike. And when they strike, the strike can be very, 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 very bad. Deuteronomy 25, verse 17 to 19. The term 25, verse 17 says, Remember what Amalekite did unto thee. By the way, when you come out from Egypt, they are coming strong, coming powerfully from Egypt, going to the promised land. And verse 18, how he made thee by the way and smote thee in the most part, in the most of thee, even of that that were feeble behind thee, when that was faint and weary, and he feared not God. The Amalekite know they were strong. They could see the smoke, the pillar of cloud in the front by the day. They could see the smoke, the pillar, the pillar of fire in their front in the night. And they wonder how do we attack this people that are so strong like this. Many and strong. Then they look for their weak point. At the innermost part, behind them, at the tail end of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the line, there are some that are weak. They are barely following. They are tired and weary from the journey. And they strike, they struck on that place, and they kill some of them. And God say, Denver, forget that. And always remember them. And if you read that one verse 19, God swear by himself and said, If you always have war with Amalekites until they are destroyed on the surface of the earth, because they struck them 
in their weakest fling. So therefore, we are strong. Just as a net or a chain, we are strong as our weakest links. And that's why we cannot afford to be weak. We cannot afford to drag behind. We cannot afford to be missing the assembly of gospel when others are going down and gathering up and praying. Well, others are gathering up and remaining strength. Don't stay behind. Because if you stay behind, the enemy can use you as a point of contact to attack. And when that attack comes, it will not be good at all. So the strength of the net is as good as its weak lens, as its weakest link. And a good fisherman will sit down before going on the sea. According to our text in Daniel 47, it said the man took his, his uh, net and he went on the sea. Before going to the sea, he will make sure he check the net and be sure every part is intact. Every thread is connected to the next thread. So that none is feeble, none is weak, none is open, none is cut away, lest be laboring in vain. We can't afford to labor in vain as brethren, as a church. Therefore, every one of us must link together. We must be connected together. We must be checking after each other. Don't just assume pastor is strong. I don't need to pray for him. Oh, don't assume that mommy is strong. I don't need to pray for her. Don't assume that that the door I didn't see her in the fellowship. Maybe because of his business or because of one thing or other that called his attention and he was not in our midst. Don't assume he's doing well wherever he is. We commit him into our prayer because when the enemy will strike, they will come through our weakest link. And sometimes, even as a pastor, it may be your weakest link. That's why we can never underestimate or underrate what the enemy can do through our weakest link. We check on everyone. We check on every point to be sure it is good. So that before we throw the net into the sea and gather our car. So the tenacity, the strength of the net must never be in doubt. Then the man himself, the fisherman, is experienced of use. Before you go to the sea, maybe I'll be catching small, small water, in small, small water like small rivers or lakes. Then it's good to the sea. His tenacity, his strength, his experience is of great use at this time. It must be the man, the tide that is, that is ready to fight and to win on the high sea because it takes a man. won't go there and be sleeping. Imagine going to the sea, maybe as a, as a, a fisherman, and you saw the other fisherman in his boat. He's just on the sea, and the man has slept off. No, he won't catch anything. He won't go there and be sleeping. He won't go there and be looking. He knew when to stretch out his net. He must know from experience the part of the water where he can go and get a good cash. He must know the deeper he goes into the sea, the better his cash. And that is why his experience, his tenacity, he must not be the third that is lazy, that is not willing to take risk. Because all this put together will determine how he can get a cash from the water he has gone to fish. So all this put together matters a lot. And mind sometimes, remember, it's on the high sea, not just a river or a lake. The sea sometimes will not be friendly. Sometimes there will be storm. Sometimes the storm can be so raging, can be so bad, like the one the disciples find themselves, and they cry, Lord, he that to going to come up and help us. Sometimes the sea will not be friendly, and some other time it will be very calm and be very friendly. All this put together will determine and will bring about what success the man will have at the end of the day. So the man in verse 46, 47 will say, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that is thrown cut into the sea and gather of every kind. So when the man throws his water, his net into the sea, then he's expecting all kind of cash. 48, which when it is full, they draw to shore. That may take time. A good fisherman, no, it might take a whole night. Like the one Brother Paul Peter was doing. He said, Yo, I say, have you anything? Have you caught anything? He said, we didn't catch anything. We have been toiling all night. Now say, why don't you try this other side? This right side. And the man said, we have tried it all night. So it means they spent at least 12 hours on that sea. And they caught nothing. If it is easy to catch things on the high sea, every fisherman will be billionaires. As a matter of fact, the whole world will be catching fish. Which means there are days we go. All night you will catch nothing. With all the experience, even your net have been put into good place. With all the effort, with all the tenacity, with all, the, with all your ability, you will still catch nothing. Even though you have done you and put all things in place, sometimes it's like that. So therefore, the man cuts his net, 
this time around, he was able to catch very much. Verse 48, and the net was full. And he drew them to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels. And the bad one, he threw them away. 49, so shall it be at the end of the war. The angels shall comfort and sever the wicked from the just. After God has caught his fishes, the war we are now is the ocean. And God is throwing his net into the water so that he may get as many as he can. And the judge shall you cast the just, he will put them to his vessel and he will remove the wicked and throw them away for 50 and shall cast them into the furnace of fire where they be willing and gnashing of teeth. They didn't count the cause. They thought they will enjoy forever and yet they didn't know they have already crossed the line. We will not cross the line beyond redemption in the mighty name of Jesus. We're going to be saying three parts before we pray. This church has got big fishing net. The world is like the ocean. And the fisherman this time around is God himself. And this church, the family, or wherever it pleases him, but for tonight we'll be focusing more on the church, is God fishing net that God has cast into the sea. The world we are, the earth in particular, it is sea where God is fishing from. In the name of Jesus Christ, he said, I will make you what? Fishers of men. So the world is the center of attraction. We are God is the sea. We are God himself. In this time around, is the fisherman. And the church is the fishing net, catching all kinds of sea, all kinds of sea things, and bringing them to shore. And secondly, we see the great separation. Just as a normal fisherman will go to the sea, and we throw his net down to the water to catch, and we're catching all kinds of things. Bottles in that same net, there be plastic in that same net, there be big fishes in that same net, small ones will be there in that same net. As a matter of fact, some fish will be in that same net, I'll be eating on that fishes in that same net. In that same net, we catch all kinds of things, and they will all be swimming in the water as long as the net is in the water. But with time, the great man, the fisherman, will bring them to the shore and we separate them. He will remove some from there and he will, the one that he doesn't need, he will throw them into the fire and burn them away. Then he will determine their destination. The one that are good will take them home or to the market or to his house or whatever he places he use them for. And the one he doesn't want, he will throw them and do them in the way he has so places. So we see that as the last, the final true destination of all the cash that have been caught since the day of resurrection, even to this morning, and to the day that Jesus Christ will come. I pray when that time comes, it will be good fishes in his hand in the mighty name of Jesus. It began the first one, the church has got big fishing net. The world is the ocean, the sea upon which God is catching his fishes. And God has thrown us, the church in particular now, that Jesus Christ bought with his with his blood. Jesus Christ died for the church. He paid with his blood. He gave his all that we, through him, might come. And the Lord, through that church, like a net, a very big net, through the teaching and the preaching of the gospel, into the high sea. And the church is catching all kinds of fish. Desirable fish and non-desirable fish. And that's why sometimes in the church you see all kinds of people there. Sometimes the church you see the you can even see one day you say so you are in the church and you are this wicked is in the church. Sometimes you somebody oh so gentle so humble so easy going all in the church because God has cast His net and He will catch all kinds of things me and you inclusive. So the church is the net of God that He has casted into the sea and is catching all kinds of people today. Matthew thirteen. Verse number 47. Verse 47 says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net which was cast into the sea. That net now is his church that is catching everyone that it can be caught in the sea that is the world that we find ourselves. Verse 30, or that same 13 of Matthew. Verse 30. Let them both grow together unto the harvest. And the time of harvest, I will say to the reaper, Gather you together, first the tar and bind them to the bundles and burn them. But the weight gather into my barn. That's exactly what it's like 
in the fish, in the church, that God is using to catch the world. It's gathering all kinds together. It's gathering all kinds together. That's why when you see the church and uh, it's not perfect, all kind of things are there. It's not perfect. All kind of human being are there. It's not perfect. All kind of sinful habit can be found. It's not a perfect place because it's a net that is gathering all kinds and it's bringing them into that same net. Some will go there, some will see the net. Just like the, in the water, some fish can be very smart. They will see the fisherman and his net and they will avoid it. The same way today we see, even though the church is calling many people to the many people, and we are calling to the gospel, to the teaching, to the preaching, but not everybody will come in. So we deliberately, systematically walk away. This guy will beat you. What's wrong with you? Come and sit down here. That last one. You are my friend, and you see misbehaving. Praise the Lord. So therefore, the church is the net. And it's calling, some we call, they will systematically avoid it. That one, I don't want it. I want to enjoy myself a little bit. That's a place I'm going. That's a place of enjoyment. That's a place of prayer that I want to stay. I want to still continue my life outside there without Christ. And systematically, they will avoid the net. And some, remember the net is like a small, small hole. So they will just go through the net because they are small size. And they will come through the net, just pass through as though the net never existed. The same thing is happening to the church too. Some will come in, look at it, look at it, and say, I can't stay here. And they will go out again. The net will allow them. And God forbid the net has broken one particular place. Every place will be coming there and be escaping. That's why the church, we cannot afford to lose whatever cash we have. Through unbelief. Through not loving ourselves. Through not caring for ourselves. If anybody will go out at all, let them be by their own self. Not because of what we have done to them. Oh, I was in that church. They never showed love to me. I'll be coming now. This is my third time. Nobody knew where I'm living, and they never cared to come. Once you close, everybody carry their bag. Nobody will say hi to me, hello. What is your name? They don't even care. They don't even see me. They only talk to themselves. When we close like this, they carry themselves. They know how to build themselves. They will hug themselves. They will shake themselves. But me, I'm like a stranger in their midst. And because of that, this man or this woman, he doesn't want to even stay in the first place. But now he has still the enough excuse to walk away. Never allow anyone to have us as an excuse to escape this net that God has created and is catching as many as we get. Never allow anyone by our behavior, by our lifestyle, by the things we are doing or things that we are not doing, we should never allow anyone to see us or to use us as an excuse, never to stay. So some will move away. In that same net, some fish will be very big and they will enter the net and some fish will be very small. All by the will of God. So fishermen will catch their own. Every fish in that thing will be very tiny, very tiny. It's not your problem. Yours is to catch the fish. Whatever comes is God. It's divine. Don't say, I will cast in my net as a church or as a pastor, as an evangelist, as a preacher. I've been casting my net to the sea for a long time. I've never for one caught a big fish. That is not your problem. Your problem is what? To draw the net. And sometimes, you big fish will come and be eating the small, small one. It happens in the church as well. And if you see the church, don't be surprised. It's part of the net. It's part of the cash that some will come and be swallowing the small, small one. And how do we avoid that? Prayers. That is why it's important we should be a praying church. Because it's not enough to call. It's not enough to bring them in. It's not enough to just say, let them come in. Anything terrible. If not, the, some of them will come in and destabilize us. You know, sometimes you see this big man, this big fish, we have this big this fisherman throw the net on the water, literally speaking now, and the net will be peaceful, no trouble in the net. Fish are there. Many fish are even coming in, but they are coming in gently and they are staying gently, waiting for the man to draw them to the shore. But suddenly one big fish will come in. And as soon as you enter the place, you begin to trouble the net. And we disturb the net. It will destabilize the net. All the water will be destabilized. If cast not taken, even the net will be broken. But that's the singular one big fish. And every cast you have before be scattered because one big fish came in. And that's why we are praying for big fish. Be very, very careful. Be very, very careful with what you are praying for. Because otherwise, you may bring in one big one that will begin to swallow the one you have labored for before now. That's why prayer can't in everything we do. Prayer is very important. We cannot survive this fishing. 
We cannot do well in this thing unless we make prayer our habit, our lifestyle. Even in throwing the fish, the net into the water, it must be back with prayer and say, God, we don't just want to catch any kind of fish. We are specific. Fish have not troubled us. Fish have not destabilized us. Fish have not come in and scatter the whole thing. Fish have not come in and begin to impregnate all our young girls. If we don't pray, they will scatter the whole thing by the time they come in. So prayer matters a lot when we are asking and we are praying that fishes should come into the church. And that's the time when we are saying God increase our number and God will not increase the number until we are specific. Until we tell him the kind of fish, the kind of the type we want, peaceful one, that we allow others to grow. And that we come in and that we suppress others and they will not allow others to enjoy the freedom that themselves have enjoyed in God hitherto. So the fitness can catch all kinds of things. And that is what is happening today. And many will deliberately avoid it. And we are be caught by the fish. Not because we are that smart. Not because we are we are done anything special, but God has halted our downward move to hell. God has halted our downward move to ourselves, our journey to perdition and eternal separation. That we almost cross the line of no return and go to a place where God has not sent us, or that where God will not want us to go. God in his eternal mercy brought us into the net to the church that himself has created. And there he began to gather us and prepare us to be taken to the shore where he will separate us for his own use. And that's why we cannot be so proud of ourselves and think, oh, it's because I want to be in church. That can be true to some extent, but mostly because God himself has dragged you to that net. You could have avoided the net just like any other fish, but God in his mercy has brought to that net so that in being in the net, you might see and see the grace to live and to stay and to be part and to be useful as long as you are in that place. Some items will switch to that place and they will never be able to stay. But God has brought you. He caught you. He delivered you like Paul on the way to destruction. But God, the light shined on his path and he saw the light in the daylight and he never compromised. He never looked back from that time on. It was that night that brought us into Christ. And it was pity or that they have not found themselves. Or they are coming and going out and they are not stable. And they don't want to graciously enjoy the grace that is within this place. Oh, they want to enjoy themselves. You people are too tight. You are not free. You don't dance like you to dance in other places that they will just dance to any kind of music and because of that they won't want to stay. No, they we must graciously look at them and be prayerfully helping them that as many as God has called, they will come into this net that God has spread for all the world to see. Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39. Matthew 24, 37. Matthew 24, 37 says, But as in the days of Noah, so we are, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days of Noah, when the floor was coming, they were eating, they saw the sheep, they were drinking, they saw the sheep, and the man building it, they were enjoying themselves, giving in marriage, and telling party here and there. They never give excuse when they invited for party. They never give excuse when it's a birthday party or marriage party or one ceremony or another. They always find the time to be there to attend all kind of barriers. They can go from here to Lokoja to, to Kafansha to any part of the world just to attend a burial ceremony and enjoy rice and rice and jollof rice. But just is church next street to them. They will have a thousand and one excuses why they will never be there. They know it's a cashing net. That they step in, they may step into a place where God will catch them and prepare them for the shore, but they don't want to stay there. So, as it was in the day of Noah, so it is even right now. They saw the ark being prepared, but they refused to enter until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them off away, all away, so shall also be coming of the Son of Man. Many, we naturally one want to be part of what we are doing just because they know the net is for god is god is cashing and is drawing as many to them say it wasn't a secret thing it's an open thing that god is drawing people to himself luke 17 verse number 26 luke 17 verse number 
26. And as it was in the days of Noah, repeating the same thing again, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So the church is God's big fishing net for the end of time. And that you are here this evening, listening or hearing me, wherever it may be, it's simply me, God has brought you into that net. It's just grace. It's just opportunity. It's just grace. It's just privilege that we have. And we must never take it for granted because not everything in the sea, in the ocean, will be taken by the net. Even a normal literal fisherman, when he throw his thing to the fish, into the net, into the water, he knew in his mind that not every fish in that water will follow the net. He will even pray to have a good one. The same to me and you. We are only here by his grace. Not everyone that have heard the gospel have responded the same way we are. And when we respond there, God does not allow us to respond in a place where we meet some other big fish that have been there before that begin to swallow us or take advantage of us. No, God brought us in a place where we can grow, where we can escape the damnation that is coming upon the world. There may be many like us given the same privilege, but they will never use it. They will never take it. Even though God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son. But that is God. Human being, many will not take advantage of that. But we must know that this church is a fishing net. And all kind of fish be there. In our own little assembly, if we don't want any kind of fish, then we must pray. We can prayerfully tell God the kind of fish we want in our church. Whom humble one the one that we allow others to grow and want to grow themselves, and the one that we stay, not that we come in and go out and be escaping and be looking for where they will just go and enjoy themselves. They want to hear the word of God. They want to grow in spirit. We have to pray that the time that we influence us, make us to serve God better, these are the time that God will allow into our fish, into our net, into our means. If we don't pray, just like a normal fisherman, we catch all kind of things. Imagine you are a fisherman, you throw your net, and the thing catch a broken bottle. You can enjoy that fish, good one. And the market, where you sell the fish, if it's wounded, nobody will buy. It can even break the net because a broken bottle. Somehow, maybe the fish are trying to avoid the thing soon to one side, and the thing just cut the net. Before you know it, the net is broken. And if by any chance the bottle even break a fish and it begins to bleed, and what and blood go into that thing, a bigger, non useless one, shark. We come in and tear your net apart and everything we escape. Those are not the kind of thing we want in our church. And that's the only thing that can only be avoided by prayer. You know, that's the reason why the devil no wants us to pray. Because we can never be a successful church, a place where love exists, where grace abounds, where people love God and serve God in humility and gentleness of mind, unless we are ready to pray. And ask God the kind of things we want. A place where we prosper ourselves. Do you know it is possible that you'll be in that fish and since the day you enter to that net, I mean to that net, and since the very day you find yourself in that net, trouble began. Everything you brought in began to capsize and nothing worked again. Everything went down the drain because the net itself has been troubled before you find yourself inside of it. If that should not be our net, where people will lose their whatever they bring in. If that should be your that should not be your net. We are our net. We are people will come in and whatever they have gathered is lost. We are even themselves, it cares not taking, they begin to lose their life. Then we have to pray. Or a place where the two big fish be fighting themselves and fighting for space and creating and say, and before you know they have factions. This one will say, I belong to Paul, that one I belong to Peter. And they cause fashion within the net of God. And before you know it, one fashion a fighting themselves. If that will not be us, we have to pray. If it's a place where we come in, our business we stay, we bring our children, four, five of them, instead of them reducing, they are increasing. That is the net we want. If we don't pray, we won't get it. That is where spiritual things differ from physical things. A fisherman in the literal sense doesn't bother himself. When they come in, we need to separate them. And if the net breaks, we repair them. But in the spiritual, it's not like that. It can be more terrible if you have accident. And that's why prayer is important. Or else, we will not catch the good fish that the law is expected from us. Then number two, the great separation. When the fish have been caught and the net is full, like we saw in verse 48, the Bible says when the net was full and this man began to draw his catch 
and draw them to the shore where it will make a separation, where it will divide, it will separate and remove one from the other and remove desirable from the non-desirable and remove the want in one from the one it doesn't want. It is then we will make that, the, the fisherman will make that separation and be, make sure that one is separated from the other. And therefore, as a church, we find ourselves in this net. Eventually, we are God has pushed us. Eventually, one day, Sunday, there will be a separation. From where we have seen in verse 30 of that same Matthew chapter 13, the Bible says, The man, the grow, he said, Let them grow both. Allow them both to be in the net, both the tear and the wheat, the good fish and the bad fish. Let them be in the net. As long as the net is not broken, just allow them to be there. And one day, they will all be put to the shore where there will be a big separation from those that are not good and those that are good. But for us as a church, our focus more will be on ourselves. And we ask ourselves, if God is if omnipot, omni, omni, mercy, omni knowledge, and his ability, his grace, his mercy has brought us together as a church. And we have found ourselves in his great net, not only as a family church, but as a church universal. We have found ourselves in that place. The question you ask yourself first and foremost is this, that if I find myself in a place I want to stay, as God has thrown his net, the church and the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of the gospel has somehow come to your place and you have been caught, and you have been found, and you are part of those in the net that God has sent and spread into the world that God has brought you in. The question that, are you willing to stay? Some will come in like this as you are coming in. They will hear what we are hearing, but they will not stay. They don't want to be part of it. They will one by one walk out, systematically, stylishly walk out, and you go after them, and they will give all kind of excuses for not wanting to stay. Because something inside of them, them, inside of them, don't want to stay within that net. Don't want to be loose. Don't want to be in the wolf, in the ocean, swimming and freely swimming, swimming to nowhere. Have you ever seen a fish before in the water? And you ask the fish, where are you going to? And say, that's a direction. No direction. They just swim and swim and swim and swim until they grow old and die. That is something we are on that human being. We just walk around, do our businesses if there is one our family and uh, get money and run out of money and run out of money if it's a man and a woman and uh, if it's a woman and another woman and all kind of things that make you happy in the world and you run and you run until great head begin to fill your head and you keep running and keep running until you cannot run again. It just want to be doing the world. That is not fair enough. But God in his omni mercy, in his graceness, in his in his wisdom has brought us together. The aside just swimming around the ocean aimlessly. I will give you an aim. I will give your life a meaning. Then the question is, are you willing yourself to stay and be a part of those in that place? Are you willing to wear and be dressed and be part of the assembly that God has graciously brought you in? In Matthew 22 verse number 11 to 12. Matthew 22 verse number 11 to 12. A man went out and called all kind of person to the wedding of his son. And sometimes they is expected them to have a particular dressing code that wish they will come into that place. And he caught all kind of guests because the original people he invited was not coming. The people he called was not coming. Just like us as a church. When we began, the people we have our mind and we call, come and join us. We think God has promised good concerning us. And if you come with us, God will do us good. We call them, they never turn up. They never show. And God said, go and carry anybody. Anybody you see, just call them and bring them in. And he said to this man, he told the people, go to the street. Bring all kind of guests because the food has been prepared and we cannot suffer waste. And they went to bring all kinds of people. And in verse 11, even though the net was catching them, it was a privilege to come to the place. But yet, even though it was free meal, free food, free opportunity to attend the party, but yet, that should be a dressing code. And in verse 11, and when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which asked not on him a wedding garment. He could have asked the man, you called me, I was on my own on the street, you brought me in, but he expected as soon as he come in, this is a palace. That's the way we dress in the palace. That's the way we look in the palace. 
It's like literally speaking, the palace in the in England. I like using them as example. Before the late queen died, I doubt if anybody in the world will say I've ever seen the cuff, the, the cuff, the chest of that woman open. Not possible. Or the man so dressed one day and he forgot herself as a queen. And you see her tight open a little. Never. And the same thing, every woman in that king. Not even, I pray they will not testify against us as a church in Jesus' mighty name. In our contemporary time, in their weddings, in their birthday, all their parties, they will never dress to show up. They dress moderately. And you never see any other, op- any other part open to the outside. The men will wear their suit and look corporate. Even when their son will dream wedding and the wedding like the wedding of the whole world and they invited guests from other places. Even women in the world that normally walk naked and they are go to the palace for that wedding, they dress for once, not mind their lives. Amen? Because they know as a driving style, even the palace may have colors. It's a privilege. There are many people on the street, just like imagine the king of England calling me and say, Pastor, come and preach in my birthday next year. I pray you get to that level in Jesus' name. What a privilege that is to appear before such a majesty. So it's a privilege in the first place to appear in the, in the, in the palace. And no such a privilege, you don't misuse of, you don't make use of it anyhow. Therefore, you must go and look for clothes befitting palace. This man forgot himself. The net caught him, but was not prepared for the net. And that's how we are, many of us. Even though we have been privileged to be in church, but it's like we are not prepared to be in church. We have been privileged to be caught by the net of the Almighty, to hear his word, to listen to the word. But our lifestyle, our behavior, the thing we do, either open or secret, never show to God that we are even interested in being the net in the first place. And in verse 11, and when the king came and saw this guest, he saw the man which has not on him a wedding garment. Verse 12, Matthew 22. Verse 12, and he said to him, friend, how come you came here and not having a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Do you know why he was speechless? Because he knew what to do. Just that he failed to do it. He knew he was called to the wedding. It was a privilege. He knew he was not even expecting the invitation. He knew he was not even looking out for it. He was called where he was just doing his own thing. But he knew also that don't appear before the king ragged. And there must be a way, a dress code. And the man refused to do it. When the king challenged him, he was practically speechless. And the next verse, the condemnation come hit and hard on him. That will not be us in the mighty name of Jesus. The church has a way of dressing. As a believer, that's a way we dress. Today, this is a mess up. That people can wear just anything to church. Just anything to church. You can dress anyhow in the church. No, it wasn't like that. That's not how to be. And the master, the fisherman, God himself, is looking at us that what kind of people are this? Even though they are privileged to find themselves in this net, but they are not making the best and the most of it by making sure that their lifestyle, their behavior, their character, their conduct is conducive and is in line with the manner that is expected of people that find themselves in this kind of place they find themselves. So therefore, if that is not our own, it's like we have been caught by the net, but we are not taking the most example of the net. And one day is coming, there will be separation. The master, the fisherman will take the fish to the shore, and there he will separate one from the other. Luke chapter 20, verse 6. Luke 20, verse 6. Luke 20, verse 6 say, But if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. They were convinced that John was a prophet. And that's a question we've asked ourselves. Even though I'm in this place, even though I've been privileged in Luke chapter 20, verse 6, I've been privileged to be in the church, even though I've been privileged to be called, to be, uh, to be, to be so-called, if you use that word, to be brought in like a fish into this big net that God has, pro- has, has spread. Am I persuaded there? Am I convinced that I'm in the right place in the first place? If you are not persuaded, you are not convinced, you won't stay. Even your staying will be a trouble for those that are persuaded. You will find fault. You will find excuses. You will be a problem for those that are there. So there must be a point you find yourself and you are convinced that you always be reason to be outside there. That you always be reason to sit down that fish that is swimming and can go anywhere he likes outside the net. But here you are in the net, the church, 
You can't swim anyhow. You can't go to any place you like. You can't travel and learn anyhow. You just say and tell somebody in the church, maybe your pastor or somebody or your department dead. I'm going to somewhere. I've been traveling for a day or two. You won't see me. You are no longer free again to travel as you to travel. There are things you cannot do now that you used to do. There are places you cannot go now that you used to go. There are things you cannot eat again as you used to eat them for. There are things you cannot drink again as you used to drink them. There are friends you cannot move again with as you used to move for. But sometimes you now look outside the net. You no, know it's transparent. It's not transparent. You can see outside, it's not a wall, and you see other fishes moving and freely enjoy themselves. But if not persuaded, very soon, you will go out of the net. Even if you are not going out of the net, you will be half in one leg, and you will be looking for one place in the net where you can put your leg out and be using that leg to be enjoying the outside while you are still inside. No, this men they are persuaded. They know that these people, they know that John was a priest, and because they were persuaded, they couldn't be tossed through and fro anyhow. Act 21, verse number 14. Act 21, verse 14. That's exactly what God wanted for us. So that not be as if we are in prison. The net is free, even though it's a net of the Almighty, the church. Yet there's an exit and entry. Free exit and free what? Free entry. You can go out if you want. You can come in if you want. If you are inside, be inside. If you are outside, don't disturb those that are inside. Many believers today, they are neither inside and they are not outside. They said they are confused. They are confused. They are not convinced why they are here. They are not even seen it as a privilege that God has brought them to the kingdom. And the, what is happening outside there, they are way of dressing. They are way of doing business. They are way of having friendship. They are way of marriage. They are way of doing their things. They are way of doing their businesses. They are way of doing things outside there. Still appeal to us. And that's why we are not persuaded. We are not convinced. We are in the church for five, ten years, and yet we know nothing about the church, nothing about the Bible. Ten years in the church, and yet a baby. You cannot even convincingly stand up and preach a single bitter message to anybody and go out on evangelism and say, God loves you. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ loves you and preach a simple message to anybody because you are saying you're not even convinced, and that's why you cannot even go out to preach in the first place. Even at Tomko, the children preach to them. Even at last I cannot even preach to them. We are not convinced. Even though we are inside the net, yet we are not convinced. One day the master will come and he knows the heart of every man. He will separate everyone, one from the other. That's the beauty of it. But before that day comes, we can sit ourselves down and begin to reconvince ourselves and ask ourselves, am I willing to stay in this net? We are being graciously caught by God. Am I willing to be part of them? I'm part of them indeed. And because I'm part of them, my lifestyle, my working life, the way I do things, my prayer life, and everything I do is even affecting and inviting others to be part of us. You're not even bothered that you are increasing or not. That's how you know you're not part of us. If we are the same number, we are even going down, you're never bothered. As soon as you leave here, you forget that it's a church. Until the day of fellowship again. Oh, today's fellowship must be there. You never remember this place again. For the day for now, since you left on Mon Sunday, today's Wednesday now. How many of us remember that it's a church? We forgot. Our businesses took our heart away. Our lifestyle, our friends, whatever we are doing, took us completely away. We forgot that it was a church. There are people that came on Sunday that we need to call and say hi to. There are people we didn't even see. We didn't bother to know that they, we didn't even remember they, we, they came. Until the next service day again, you know, say, Oh, sorry, we didn't see you last Sunday. I forgot to call you. Yes, literally, we can forget. That's no problem in that. But the reason why we forget most times is because we are not even interested. We forgot as soon as they live here. And if you're not interested in where you are finding yourself, you didn't see it as a privilege, you didn't see it as an as opportunity to be here. You didn't, take, you didn't see the importance. How will you convince others to be part of us? How will you not see somebody on Sunday? And you will make it a prayer point and say, God, strengthen that person. Whatever the problem is, next time, let him be able to come to our means. I will make it a prayer point. I will be interested in praying and say, wow, the shed that are empty is even more than the shed that are filled. And make that a prayer point. How many of you can boldly say that in my prayer life for the past one year, not even last one month, even for the past one year, that make it a prayer personally that God fill the empty shares. We never care. We don't bother ourselves. I'm not the pastor. That pastor's headache to be facing his own problem. 
You know why? We don't care. We don't see ourselves as part of the people inside the church. We are only here sometimes because we have no choice. If I'm out there now, they'll be disturbing me. So let me come in. My husband is here. Let me join them. Or my wife is here. I say, man, let me join them. Oh, my parents are here. Let me join them. Oh, I have to be here. I have to be somewhere. somewhere. That's why we are here sometimes. We are not concerned. We are not bothered. And that's why if care is not taking all kind of fish is coming. At the end of the day, we are sitting and we complain. This is not how we are doing it. Too. This is not how it has begun. No. This is not how we are taught. Too. Who are these people coming inside now? Have you ever sometimes pray about it? You never care. The shares are empty. You never bothers you. That's where you will know you are not even persuaded to be here in the first place. Because if you are convinced, if you are persuaded, you'll be thinking in your head, what can we do? What next can we do? What can we do? What, what's, next? what's the agenda? And you begin to bring out plans and say, Pastor, can we consider this? Even though the plan was rejected, that also means you should not try on that one. Pastor, can we try this and make sure that the empty shares are filled? Because it's not good that we just come in every time empty share. You never bother yourself. Even your own house, if your house is empty and there are no human being there, won't you be concerned? God forbid that the house that was five people before, four people, and suddenly they begin to miss and there are emptiness. Not because they are getting promotions. Not because children are getting admission and they are going somewhere, but some evil are happening and the house is becoming empty. Won't you be concerned? And the church of God is empty and we are not concerned. It means we are not persuaded in the first place that we are here. We are not convinced. And if you are not convinced, then we will not be able to prayerfully stay inside and be part of what we are doing. If the fish is not convinced that the net is a home, it will be looking for a way of escape. What do I say? If the fish is not convinced that the net is a home, what? It will be looking for a way of what? Of escape. And I heard some of us are like that. We are looking for a way of escape. If you have a way, we disappear. We will not see you again. So in Acts 21, verse 14, Acts 21, verse number 14. So once you are in that net, you have to be convinced that you are in the right place in the first place. And therefore, that is what will make you to want to, want to stay in that place. Acts chapter 21, verse number 14. And when he will not be persuaded, we see, saying, the will of the Lord be done. What was the case? Paul the Apostle. He was moving around the world, the world of his time, in Asia Minor, was going from place to place, preaching the gospel. And every city, wherever Paul came, somebody will rise up and say, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, you will not come back. They will kill you. Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. It's go to a place, Agabus, a renowned prophet. I prophesied so many things before then. And they have come to pass, including one particular famine and terrible drought that happened in the old world at that time. And Agabus was in the meeting where Paul was teaching. And Agabus to the guard of Paul. He doesn't know what was being the car, Paul just a, a, a kind of um, a neck thing that into the tie in those days. Just put around your neck. They still do it today. Some men use it. Some pastor, they put like a shawl around their neck, around their neck like this. And Paul was using such thing and now put on one particular chair. And Agabus came in to that shawl and bound himself and tied his hand. And he said, Any, the man that owned this thing, this is how they will tie him in Jerusalem. And he will not escape it. And everybody was weeping, was crying because they know once Agapos said it, don't go and pray. That's done, it is done. And we are crying and we are saying, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul say, What do you mean? To die or to live? What's the difference? If I die, I'm Christ. If I live, I'm Christ. Jerusalem, here I come. And they all kept silent because they couldn't convince him. He was a persuaded man. Was a persuaded man. I pray nobody will take us from where we belong in Jesus' mighty name. Our young one now, thank God for admission. You go to campus, you meet this friend. I mean to tell you and tell you all kind of things and tell you all kind of negative things about church, about Jesus Christ, about the Bible. And before you know, you throw your Bible away and you have all the things you taught you for the past one year, you forgot about them. You follow that girl or that boy and you are lost on campus. And I told him, be trying and be, and be trusting oh, with that boy, that girl. We have trained him so well, he cannot go back again. All the while, you are not even here. You are not persuaded. If just one person can meet you one overnight and throw you away, off balance, it means you are never persuaded. You are never part of force. You are only coming because you have no choice. 
And as many of children are persuaded and not taking the most advantage of where they belong, one day the owner will come and the Bible says the Lord knows those that are his. Even though human beings may not know, the Lord knows. And the every fisherman knows the good one from the bad one. And there's no better fisherman than God of heaven himself. He knows the good from the bad. And one day he will make a separation. I pray when that day comes, Nothing will separate us from him in Jesus' mighty name. Romans 4, 21. Romans 4, verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he has promised is able also to perform. God has dragged you to the net. But because he has made some promises and you are not seeing the fullness of that promises in your life, you are praying, you have done all kinds of things and it's not coming to pass yet, then you are dragging your feet, you are going outside the net and you want to disappear back into the ocean, where you are brought out from in the first place. Don't go back. Be persuaded. Brother Paul say, what is it? Is it height? Is it death? Is it life? Is it money? Is it woman? What is it that will take us for the love of Christ? Nothing. It was a persuaded man. If you are not persuaded, there is a nothing out there you will see that will take you outside this net. Believe you me. There is nothing you take that will see that will take you outside the net. As a matter of fact, you see enough that you begin to see yourself as a problem. That you are the one suffering and the one those outside that the one enjoying. And because you think you are the one suffering and that the one enjoying, you will not see the need to talk to them to feed the empty share that are before you. So we must be persuaded. We must be convinced that we have made our choice. We have confessed our sin. We have come to Jesus Christ. His blood has washed us in his, in his, in his mercy. And has forgiven us our sin. We have chosen him and his father as our God and our Savior. And we are not going back. It takes persuasions to do that. It takes conviction to do that. We must be convinced, we must be persuaded. Or else there will be nothing to take us away from outside his reign. I remember many years ago, Nigeria was playing. This word that shouting make me to remember that. Nigeria was playing ball on a Sunday morning. I come and see Pastor Kenny. I wasn't a pastor then. Went to wash the ball. And after the ball, I came to the church. I felt bad that day. And God so good, they beat us like, like uh, black and blue that day. And that day, I make up my mind. Nothing will ever make me to miss a church service for ball again. Nothing. Nothing. It's because one is not persuaded. If you are convinced that there's a life where you are going to, and every opportunity to stand before him is life for you, you will not leave the place. Not for anything. Not for any business, not for any market opportunity, not for any opportunity. And that's why more time Muslims are better than us in every application. The other I was trying for my mother in law barrier, and the very cool we took got to a particular point. The driver said, I want to pack, I want to pray. We have no choice. He packed, he prayed. And we continue the journey. Believers will not do that. They'll be afraid. They won't try it. They don't go to church. The man that took me when I was coming back was he was I think I came on Saturday was he was going back the following day again I think on Sunday yes I think on Sunday I came princess Saturday Sunday morning I came it was well, the following day and I was trying to ask him I was church he never know the, he said Christian he said he's only Christian among them only in names he never even know the rest of church he wasn't convinced we are not persuaded. And one of the reasons why we are not pastors is because we don't know the how to pray. If you don't pray, you can never be convinced in Christian things. And it will be difficult for your life to have meanings. Prayer gives life to meanings. There's nothing we can do as believers that we can ever receive from God without praying. And because we are lazy in the place of prayer, we are never made prayer a priority in our life. Our leg is dragging out. And we are comparing ourselves with those outside there. Forgetting that a day of separation is coming. And lastly, two final destinations. When the separation comes, there will be destinations. When the fisherman comes to the shore and bring his cash and he begins to empty the net, he will remove the bottle, remove the plastic, remove all the stone that finds itself into the net, remove all the grass, remove all the bad fish, poisonous fish, remove all of them. He won't throw them sometimes back to the water, he throw them where they will destroy. Where they be destroyed. And that is how it will be on the last day. The good Lord that have spread this big net that catching us and bringing us to salvation through his son Jesus Christ 
one day, one day, we separate both the good from the bad. And that's what we saw in our text. Let's see that place again, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, I read from verse 48. Matthew 13, verse 48. And again, the kingdom, verse 48, when, it, the, the, when, and when, which when it was full, they drew to the shore, sat down, gathered the good vessel into the, the good into the vessel, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel will comfort. And they will survive, they will separate the wicked from among the just. And we cast them, the wicked, into the furnace of fire. They shall be willing and gnashing of teeth. And in verse 30, he said the same thing. And let them both grow together because a day of harvest is coming. We are there will separation. And the time of harvest, I will say to the rapers, the angel, gather ye together, the first, the tars, and burn them in bundle, and throw them into fire. And the weight you gather into my barn. There will always be two different destinations. And we can always choose one. That's where the net is being gathered in the first place. Those that are left in the ocean, that they fight and self in this particular team, in this particular net called church, they are automatically doomed. Because one day we come, the sea will give up everything then to be judged. So if you have a privilege to be caught with the preaching and the hearing and the teaching of the kingdom and you are in the church, it's a great privilege. Don't go back there again. Don't go back to the sea, to the world, where you'll be doomed. And if you are in this church, you are in the, in the net that God has graciously brought you, be part of the church. So that when the final judgment will come and the separation will take place, me and you, we have no place outside the purpose and the mind of God for us in the mighty name of Jesus. You know, be cast out and cast away from his presence like others that never enter the church in the first place. Is it not better safe that we are still in the world swimming in sin, enjoying ourselves in clubs, enjoying ourselves in hotel on Sunday morning, enjoying ourselves whatever we can do with our life outside there? Is it not better that to be in church and still go to hell? And they be separated and say, I don't even know you. Where do you when do you find yourself into this net? And you've been wondering for the past 30 years, I've been here, sir. And it's 30 years. In my record, I have known nothing of you. That will not be us in the mighty name of Jesus. And that's how song will be. On the last day, after this, I was in this night, I say, I feel counted the cross. There's a line that the Lord has drawn. And it will pass that line, that coming to him. You are gone. I feel counted the cross. Have you counted, have you consider what the penalty will be if for any reason you miss this opportunity? Matthew 7, verse 14. Matthew 7, verse 14. Let me read from verse 13. Matthew 7, verse 13. It says, Enter ye in at a straight gate, narrow gate. Straight there mean narrow, not the straight of straight line. Narrow gate. For why is the gate? Because it's open. Is the ocean. Big is the ocean. Wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. Somebody will say, how can God just be manageable, be okay with the small net? And yet there are big fish, many of them inside the ocean, going to destruction. That was how it was in the day of Noah. The world was in thousands and millions of their numbers. But how many were safe? Only eight. Did God bothered? Did this change God? Did this thought to be God from that day? And see, because the whole world is perished, only eight people are safe. God will destroy you too from heaven. Now become a less God. Does it happen like that? God was see God when the whole world was destroyed. It doesn't cost God. You just say, say few, many are called, but few be chosen. Even among those that are chosen, some will still not make it. Especially if they're not pastor there, they're not convinced where they are. And one of the ways you know you are convinced, you are concerned. Just like a child or a man that have a family. And the love, the, the trouble, the, the, the wellness of your house, of your own family is not your concern. Then you're not part of that family. Somebody is thinking the family, you're not concerned. There's no food for the family. You're not, it's not your prayer point, you're not concerned. Things are not going well, business well, you're not concerned. Spiritually, there's a pattern that's going on, you're not concerned. Never your prayer point, you're not bothered about your own family. Then, obviously, you're a bastard in that house. The same thing in the church. If you are part of the house, then what happens? How will be your concern? It means you are persuaded, you are happy to be a part of the church. If you are not concerned, you are not persuaded, you are not bothered, you are not worried, then it shows what is wrong. 
Take, for example, you are in the church, somebody is pregnant, and pregnancy cannot be hidden. And for the nine months, that woman was pregnant. You can't remember a single day that you pray for that woman on your own as a prayer list. And you pray and pray for everything you want, all the money, all the car, all the business, everything you want. You trouble God with them every day. But you never remember one day you pray for that woman for safe delivery. It shows you are not part of us. You are not concerned about us. Or somebody in the church not doing very well, and you are privileged to know that the business is not going fine, things are rough, or this man is in debt, it's a big loan around his neck, and somehow the information will reach you. Or from the way you can see it, one day you see on a normal day, you pass the house, you see the children outside playing, and you ask children, why are you not in school? We are not in school today because our school fees are not being paid. And that never bothers you. Never pray about it. Never concern about it. Never, even though you are not paying the school fees, but it never enter your prayer list. It shows you are not part of us. You are not convinced you are part of us. Because you are part of us, our matters matter to you. Or you will see one of our members enjoying sin outside. You are passing that place. You see one of our men in, in a beer parlor and enjoying this bottle of green bottle of beer before him. And man just enjoying himself. And you will say, bro, how are you? And you just pass by. It never bothers you. That never becomes a prayer point for you. Something is wrong with you. You are not part of the church. That's only way we can show you are part of us that you are concerned with what goes on in our means. And uh, if you are that concerned, then you'll be worried about the end of everyone that is in there, including your very self. Matthew 7, verse 14. Matthew 7, verse 14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which lead to life, and few there be that find it. Then you'll be worried about yourself. How will I be among the few that find this narrow gate? How will I be among the few? How oh, we have been among the few. That would be a prayer point for you. That would be a concern for you. Just imagine being in the church for a long time and yet you didn't make it to heaven. The other day I was reading the news about a young man that was beating a drum for his church and he collapsed. Why he was beating a drum in Nigeria here in Lagos last year? Some of us we hear the news. The man collapsed. It was a married man of two or three children and he collapsed on that drum and there finally he went. He never returned back. You know what came to my mind in the first place? And they said, I've been beating the drum for that church for the past nine years. What came to my mind is this. Somebody died right inside the church by the side of the altar. I asked myself, is it going to heaven or hell? If he meets, if he meets heaven for no reason, and the angel saw him, or demons saw him, they say, for the past nine years, you've been drumming and praising God, and yet you are here with us. What a shame that will be. What a shame that will be. And that's why it's not about activity. It's not about what you are engaged with in the church. It's about your being persuaded that you are part of the church. You are convinced that this net that caught you is worthy of you. And you are worthy of the net. And you are eagerly and waiting and wishing that one day when the separation will come, you will find yourself, you will see the narrow gate and be among the few that will walk through it. If only few will find the narrow gate, it means the majority are where? And the broad part... And once and some of the majority, I bet you me, they are marching from the church into the narrow, into the broad gate. May that not be our story in the mighty name of Jesus. Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 and 15. Revelation 20, verse 13 and 15. So it is important that we take cognizance of the fact that we have been privileged to be here. And that we are here, which will indeed be part of the place. In prayer, in commitment, in committing your life, your well-being, your future, your eternal rest into God's hand in prayer. In reporting yourself to him, if there are anything you are battling with secretly in your life, and you know this thing will naturally likely kill me if I don't report to God in the place of prayer and repent of faith, you commit yourself to God in prayer. You don't just live a don't care life. If you commit sin, we know we commit sin, and we should feel bad about it and tell God we are sorry. But you get to a level you're going to commit sin. You don't even know you're commit sin again. That's a very terrible place to be. May God help us in Jesus' mighty name. Revelation 20, verse number 13. And the sea gave up the death which you are in it. As men that are being caught by the, by the net. As men that thought they have escaped God's judgment and they enjoyed themselves in the world. They see one day we give up everything in them. This earth, one day we spill out everything you are swallow. Every dead you are swallow. And that day is coming. That is the day of separation. And the sea gave up the death which are in them, small and great. And they stand before God. Verse what am I reading now? Verse 13. And the sea gave up the death 
they were in it, and death and hell deliver up the dead that were in them. Death, hell, dead, me grave. As men that die and in the grave, they will give up themselves, and they will be a judge every man according to what their was that they have enjoyed, their was that have taken them away from the net, their was that have distracted them, and they thought they have escaped God's judgment, and they forgot about redemption. They will judge according to their was. And verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, written as among those that graciously find their way into the net, and they are stayed faithful to the God that caught them in that net, as many whose name are not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that place there is no smiling. We not go there in Jesus' mighty name. Please say good amen. A convincing amen. amen. That's how it will be when the Son of God will come and will separate the world and will judge everyone according to their words. Please, if you are here, be here. If you have been caught graciously to be part of the church, not just first family church as a person, as a church, but the church of Jesus Christ, you have been called, you are part of that church, please be there. See it as a privilege, as an opportunity. And be concerned about what goes on in the place. Let it bother you. Let it be your thinking. Don't just live here and forget that it's a church. Which is the problem of many of us. As soon as we do the grace and we get out of that gate, we forget that it's a church. Until we come back again. Sometimes we don't even remember to come back. I'm trying during the week. On Friday now, come here on Friday. You'll see how many people that will be here on Friday morning to pray. And if you don't pray, how do we escape it? Nobody will make heaven if we cannot pray. How do we escape it? How do we be a modus that be counted worthy to be count and be brought out and be put in the barn, in the place, in the heaven, in the place of God and say, these are my beloved sons and daughters in whom I am well pleased. How do we be part of that list if you don't know how to pray? You can't pray about your own life, about your own sinful state, about your own spiritual life. You know you're not going spiritually and yet you're not a prayer point. I'm not even concerned. I'm not even bothered about it. How many of us will not be, will not be growing physically and are not bothered? Though that is generally happening. Some people that even their physical life is not better. They're not growing. They're not spiritual. They're not physically better. They're just in one particular place. That shouldn't be us. It should make it our lifestyle that we pray for ourselves and pray for others and be concerned about ourselves and concerned for others as well. Because that matters a lot before God. And on the last day, when the Lord will hear our voice, and we say, Father, I've been in the church for a long time. I've even drummed in your name. I've sung in your name. I've clapped in your name. I've danced in your name. I've done this in your name. I've done that in your name. I've given my time, given my offering. I've even avoided doing some bad, bad things, all in your name. May not be replied to us and say, I never knew you. You are never part of me in the first place. May that not be us in the mighty name of Jesus. I close with this story. A man took his wife to court. 22 years of marriage. And said, I'm not doing it again. I'm not doing it again. I'm, I'm tired. This woman never obedient. This woman never submissive. This woman, if I say one, she will say ten. This woman, and she can't tell all the things that the woman is doing. And just look at them and say, tell me how much you pay for dowry. So that the woman return it to you. And I will divorce, dissolve the marriage. The woman said, he never paid my dowry. And the man said, there was no wedding in the first place. All of you go to the house, nothing to divide, because you have never been wedded in the first place. 22 years of staying together. 22 years of serving God. 20 years of fellowshipping. 20 years of going to church. 20 years of coming to Bible study. 20 years of Sunday. For the past 22 years, if they can't, how many Sunday you have missed that you go to church, it can not be able to turn. And yet, at the end of the day, say, I do not know you. Is that a good one? What's a good one? That you have never been married to me in the first place. I never paid for your dowry. I shed my blood on the cross of Calvary to pay for the dowry of my own. I never see the mark on you. You are not part of mine. 22 years in service. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. And all because you refuse to be convinced. You refuse to be inside. You are inside. You are outside. You are never persuaded. You are never concerned. You are never bothered. Even about your own self. About your own self. Not bother. How much more bother about others? Look at us now. Some people are not here. That are to be here. That have been here before. After the service now, we see how concerned you are about them. 
either in praying for them or in asking after them. You are not bothered. Then how are you convinced God you are part of them? That day when self pressure may come, you'll be counted among them. Maybe not hear that voice and say, I never knew you. You are never part of those I pay my dowry for. I use my blood to pay for. May that not be the voice we hear in the mighty name of Jesus. Can you bow here and say, Father, please help me in the mighty name of Jesus? I've graciously been fear. Bow your hand, your hand and pray to God. Say, I've graciously found myself in this net that is called church that you have drawn me here. Not just church local where we are here, here, but the church of Jesus Christ. And by privilege here, we find yourself the Lord, my days and my time here will not be wasted in the mighty name of Jesus. It will not be wasted in any way. I'm not a pastor there. I'm not convinced. I'm not even a part of the body of Christ. Lord, have mercy upon me. Count me as part of yours in the mighty name of Jesus. It will be a sad thing to come to church like this. And then one day you discover you long time ago you have missed the line and you are not part of them. Lord, have mercy upon me in the mighty name of Jesus. What is it that is distracting you, taking you away, and gradually taking your attention, your time, and drawing you away, and drawing you back, and you are gradually going back to the ocean, where you have been redeemed before, and taken out, ask God for mercy. The Lord, I'm going back already, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me, pardon me, and have mercy upon me. What is that is tying you down, taking you away? Ask God for mercy this hour in the mighty name of Jesus. Are you prayerful? Even when you are praying, do you pray for others? Do you concern about others? Do you bother yourself about others? When you don't see them, are you bothered? When the chairs are empty, are you bothered? What are your prayer points? How many of those prayer points affect the life of others? Ask God for help. This are. I say, Father, please help me in the mighty name of Jesus. Are you engrossed in sin? Are you enjoying the inside and see enjoying the outside at the same time? Ask me, see. I say, God, have mercy upon me in the mighty name of Jesus. I am here already. I don't want to go out again. I'm here already. I don't want to go out again. I don't want to be casted out and casted off and say, you are not part, I'm not part of you. When the time comes, that you will separate the world. Father, have mercy upon me in the mighty name of Jesus. That song say, I feel can't take the cause if your soul be lost. Are you bothered about your soul at all? If anything happens now, you close your eyes and you open it and it's on that side of the world that you open it. Are you bothered where you spend eternity? Are you concerned at all? Ask God for help this evening and say, God, that help me. In the mighty name of Jesus. I don't want to miss out. This net has graciously caught me. The preaching, the gospel, I'm part of the church. Lord, may I not be casted out again. Never again. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, please help me. 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 Is it friendship? Is it business? Whatever it is that is taking you away from him. And taking you and drawing you back. Say, Father, have mercy upon me. Enough, enough now. I'm not going back to the world again. I'm in the church. I'm in the church. I'm not going back again to sin, to save, to, to those things they do out there. I'm here. I want to be part of this place. Father, have mercy upon me in the mighty name of Jesus. My stay in the church will not be wasted. I will not be cast out. When the name be counted, in those that are written in the book of life, among those that be, cast, that be brought out of the ocean of life, Lord, my name be part of them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, have mercy upon me in the mighty name of Jesus. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. I want to pray for you if you have discovered you have found yourself back to the, to the ocean again. You are swimming as you like out there. Or oh, you are not totally convinced you are here. You are in this church, but you know in your heart you are not actually part of the church. For the past 10 years, 20 years, 5 years, you are 10 Sunday services, but you know actually in your mind. If the road should be called and the, fisher, the big man himself, God of heaven, will come and separate the living from the dead, you will not be among them. Can I see your hand as I pray for you this time? Say, Father, have mercy upon me in the mighty name. Raise your hand to the heaven to God and say, Father, have mercy upon me. I'm coming back afresh. I want to receive you afresh into my heart, to be washed afresh, to be made clean afresh. Father, have mercy upon me in the mighty name of Jesus. You have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Talk to God. Talk to God. Raise your hand to the heaven and talk to him and say, Father, have mercy upon me. Just you between you and him. Nobody care either they see you or not. A day will come. Nobody care either they see your hand up or not. Nobody care either you are in the church or not. Everybody will answer his own name before the throne of grace. Say, Father, have mercy upon me. I raise my hand to the heaven and say, I want to start afresh again. I want to begin afresh again. Do I sing? Do I shout? Do I dance? But I know within my heart I'm not part of them. I'm not even convinced. But Lord, I want to start afresh. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Talk to him. Lord, say, have washed me in the blood of Jesus Christ. Make me clean. And give me the grace to start all over again. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' 
mighty name we are praying. Say, Father, please say it to me if your hand is up. Father, have mercy upon me. I come to you this hour. I submit myself to you. Whatever it is that's taking me off you, now I'm, going, I'm not going back again. I'm dropping all at your feet. I can't allow myself to be taken away from you again. I've been privileged to know you and to come here. Father, have mercy upon me. Watch me, brother Jesus Christ. Whatever I've done in the past in sinfulness, have mercy upon me. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I commit my heart to your hand. Watch me, brother Jesus Christ. I have set you and receive into my life. Never again to go back to the world in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Father, thank you for your word. You know you are a faithful God. Lord, in any way we are drawn back. The Bible says that we are not ordained that draw back to perditions, but then that believe to the saving of soul. There are some out there now enjoying themselves, doing whatever they like, but we are here. After all this, we must not miss it. Father, please have mercy upon us. Father, please have mercy upon us. Father, please have mercy upon us. All this one leg in, one leg out. It ends now in the mighty name of Jesus. From now henceforth, our hearts, our minds, our life, our leg, our hand, all our being belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And when that day will come, you will come to separate the good from the bad. May we not be counted among the bad ones in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Blessed be your name. May what we hear today never stand against us in judgment. Help us to walk before you uprightly in truth and in holiness. In the mighty name of Jesus. Wherever you are sinned against you in any way, in any form, Father, have mercy upon us. Watch out the blood of Jesus Christ. As I confess to you, receive us in your mercy. Give us the grace to stand before you faithfully and in truth in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Blessed be your holy name. On the last day, may we not count the year you are spent in church and discover it has been wasted. In the mighty name of Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. What we take our leave? Is there any question about the study? Any question? The parable or the fishing net? Any question, please? Before mama, any other one? Can you please help me arrange mic for mommy? Yes, my brother to have a question. Any other one, please? We can ask questions in the study so you can analyze and learn together. Any other question, please? Yes, mommy, your question, then after that, my brother. God bless you. We are glad to have you in our midst, sir. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh -huh. If the net that caught fishes. Please, help me, I need that mic for mommy very well. And Is it on? Let me put it in your mouth very well if it's not on. And the fishes you find themselves in a broken or troubled net. net. The fishes that find themselves in a broken or, or troubled, troubled net. net. And they escape back into the sea. Can they stay if they did not escape? Okay. What can they do? What can they do? Uh -huh. I think I like that question. And I like in the first in the sense that they find themselves in a trouble or broken net. Which many of us have found ourselves before. At one point or the other, I find myself in a church I can call a broken net. Or a church that is troubled. Where your part of it. Earlier I was talking to my wife and I said, I wonder why I stay where we have this long before we, we got out of that place. Because to be sincere, it was a broken net and a troubled one. So you find yourself in that place. Number one, make it a prayer point. Because one, whatever makes the neck to be broken or troubled in the first place is because somebody somewhere is not praying. And not just the pastor alone, all of us are involved. And any net can be so affected. It can be here, it can be anywhere. If you refuse to make it a prayer point, prayer makes a lot of difference. No net will stand the test of time that will not be broken at some point or the other unless the people inside of the net discover the habit of praying. That's one. And number two, they discover love for the net. 
And you can never discard love for the net unless you are praying for the net. And if you discard love for the net, then you begin to see where the broken spot is and see how you can help to repair it. But you discover the broken pieces or where there is bad and the bad spot and you are not doing anything to remedy it. It's a problem on its own. It's a pastor. Now I'm not the pastor. Let the pastor do solve his own problem himself. No. We are all involved and prayerfully we must all be involved. But having prayed, having done your part to repair small, small things in your own little capacity that you must not also do to solve the pastor there, you do your own little repair and it is not working. If it is possible and there's another net somewhere, please enter into it. I will listen, please. It is better to go to a safe net than to try to manage a broken one that you cannot even help to repair. Don't you understand what I'm saying? Am I clear, please? So if there's a safe net very close to you, just simply swim out and swim to a place where you know your eternal salvation can be helped. That is after you have prayed and you have done all you could to help to repair the damages that are discovered that are seen. You report it to the right authority and you make your noise, your voice known and say, this thing is not good the way it is. Let repair our sheep. The sheep is broken and waters are coming in. As a matter of fact, some fish that we are caught are escaping. And even with that here now, we are always surviving by God's grace. The ocean, the tide of the ocean, the wave of the ocean, the force of the ocean can even push you out of the net. And you have complained to the right people and you have prayed yourself. And there is no help. Please look for help. If there is another safer net around and swim there where your eternal salvation is safe. Not every net, not every church is going to heaven. Say that from me. Are you here now? So if you find a better place, swim in there and pray for to heaven. And it can even be friendship. Maybe a particular friends. And you know that this particular person is not helping you. Why not go to another friend and look for another new friend that want to make heaven? And it's not only church, even our families. We must be careful to repair the broken thing there. If everybody in the family doesn't care about heaven, that's a problem on the mountain. Then we must prayerfully begin to see how you can repair that brokenness. And you can help. And where your help is not enough, look for a place where you can put your head and where you hear the word of salvation that will strengthen your heart, strengthen your legs, strengthen your feet against the tide of the ocean. Let's be swept off with the tides of the sea. I pray on the force we get lost in Jesus' mighty name. So, ma, we can pray. And prayer is the only way, it's the only power we have. It's the only thing. God will do nothing to help any net, any church, if they put there and not praying. And that's why you cannot afford to be missing prayer meetings. And I said at the beginning that the strength of the net, the strength of the chain, is as strong as its wicked point. If we are ten here, and nine of us are always praying, one is not praying, that one will be our problem. We don't want to fall sick every time. Having accident, having calamity, having issue every time. And because that person having issue every time, all of us will be concerned, Abby. So the weakest point is always the point the enemy attack from most time. But if we are all equally strong, equally strong, it will be difficult for them to penetrate through us. And if for any reason, by any chance, one of them is any one person, one person is affected, we all run in and immediately. And the person is easily dragged out from the enemy's trap on time than when we are all sleeping or most of us are sleeping. We are strong as our weakest link. And that's why we cannot take chance by ignoring ourselves. Oh, maybe it's our brother. If we come again next time, ah, the time doesn't come, be careful, be praying, be happy because you don't know what is going to, what she's going through. She may be your problem. I pray that uh, the Lord help us in Jesus' mighty name. And when you have done your best and it seems the sheep cannot be helped, join another sheep as long as the sheep is going to heaven. I might say something. God will help us in Jesus' name. Mommy, is that, is that okay, ma? God bless you, ma. Sir. Yes, sir. Sir, you said something a while ago, basically about, let me see, evangelism about when people come into the church premises and somehow you try your best to persuade them to stay 
listen to the word of God and at the end of the day, individually have opinions on how they convince you that they can't stay, they leave. I do not have a question, but I just want to give an opinion, which I want you to explain that opinion in a way okay. that I might understand. Okay. You know, it's just an opinion. Now, first and foremost is that I feel like when the Bible said that my sheep hear my voice and when I call them, they know me. Mm -hmm. It is just as the same when I say when God anoints his own, just like the way you are, you are ministering to us, sir. There are people assigned to your voice that God wants you to win over. Just like every other minister of God in different various um, posts that God has given to them, opposed to pastors and everything. So, I feel like with my experience and testimonies of people I've had and when I'm talking to them about God and everything, uh, I feel like people are, people are, like for instance now, so just the way I came into this church now, listening to you, somebody can come into this church now and, and just be like, okay, I, I, I get I the stay. message, I can stay. Mm -hmm. And there are some people that, that alone, that alone, for me to say, I get the message, I can stay. Practically, I'm among people that God has anointed to your voice. Mm -hmm. So, there are some people that will just come and they will not want to stay. So, it's not like maybe the aspect of they are just talking you out of the fact that they don't want to stay and making painting, the atmosphere of painting, whoever that is there, that, this and that. So, what do you think about that? God bless you, sir. I perfectly understand the question. As much as I want to agree that yes, I, 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 in, in the course of the teaching, I constantly make reference to the fact that the Church of Christ, not necessarily here, but the church as a whole, once you are be caught in that net as part of the church, either here or the church as a whole, stay in the church. Be part of the church. Not necessarily as a local assembly, but as the church of Jesus Christ. That is one. Then secondly, uh, the go to your question, if we look at it as um, there are people that are assigned to a particular place or a particular voice, particular thing, then there's a possibility of we being careless. Or just assume the person that came in and is going is not part of my own. How do you know the difference? It's just like a, a, a fisherman that threw his net. How did they know the fish that God has given to him? There are some fish that God has said this is your fish. Before you enter that place, God knows that many fish have entered your net. Are you following? God knows the fish that have entered that net and the fish that will escape and the one that will not enter. God knew before you even went through the net. Before you even leave yourself, God knows. But you as a person doesn't know. And therefore, every fish is important. And that's how it is for a, a pastor. Everyone that enters your church is important. Because you never know who is who. You never know who God wants you to win or touch. And from the one that God just says, just pass and go. Or God just, or just pass and go. You never know different. And that's why you cannot afford to run after some. Because Bible says that uh, I, I do this because of this. I do that because of this. So that by all me, I may win some. So therefore, you never know who is who. That you may eventually win. That God will be happy with you. So therefore, everyone that comes in is important. Now, if you have run, you have run, or you have tried your best to call the person, to try to win the person, and the person is not winnable, what do you do? You allow it to go. That one, you cannot help it. Are you following, sir? You can't help it. But as much as in your power, you want to be sure that everyone that comes around you are not losing any. That's the job of every pastor. If God gives you a thousand people to come across your... I was telling you, talking to someone later, I said... All the people that come across us as a church, as first time, how wish we retain them all? Though it is not possible to retain them all, that everyone that entered the church for the first time stay. It's not possible. But the job of every pastor is to see that everybody stay. Not because you want to make money out of them, but because you feel by hearing the word of God, they stay. Oh, they are blessed. And if anyone you come across and you go, so I'm not coming to your place again, I'm going to that other place. As long as that person is preaching the word of God, what do you do? You are happy for the person. As long as it's not going to masquerade, it's not going to go and be putting head down five times in a day, it's not going to other places where Jesus Christ is not, the place is going to is Jesus Christ is there, then you allow him to be. Amen. 
but you don't take chance on anyone. Everyone that comes across your way is important because you never know who that God will want to win for you. Look at Stephen. He was praying for those that, crucif- that was killing him. He said, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. But that prayer did not work on everyone in that meeting. In that execution, executing, not meeting now, execu- that execution owners that killed him. The prayer did not work for all of them, but it worked for Paul. And Paul, you know, win or won more than Stephen, a thousand Stephen will win. Paul, you know, won them. And everyone that came to, through Paul to Christ, Stephen is attached to them. Even to today. Paul wrote most of the books in the New Testament by that single prayer. But that prayer was not meant for him alone, it was meant for everybody. But he prayed the prayer, not knowing who he benefit from. And Solomon said, he said, cast your bread upon many water. Cast it out your seed here. Cast it out there. Cast it out there. You never know who will survive. And that's what the preacher, the preacher does. So we go for evangelism. So we, we, we dribble chat. Sometimes you give out chat. As you are turning your back, you see your track on the ground. Abby, what do you do? But as long as you give this chat, it will benefit their life. Yours is to give it out. Just throw the net. Those that will cash is only God that determines them. But never see anyone. Even when the person is losing out, don't relax. Don't give up. See, try your best to win the person. Who knows? Because the one that you even win, the devil that doesn't want to win the person will not take it easy for you. Look at Stephen now. As many Stephen just said, God, and it was a painful death. I said, God, this people they will never make heaven. You see, they will make heaven. Paul will never repent. The curse will work on him. But out of his agony, despite the agony, out of his, out of his heart, he prayed for them. And eventually, look at what happened through Paul. So that's how a fisherman works, an evangelist, evangelist works. Everyone is important. The devil knew that Paul will do much. And that's why he pushed him to kiss Stephen. So that the agony of that death will cause him. I was told, uh, I was told that the two towns, they are having issues, fighting themselves. And they caught and they do to their, their gods. And their gods said they should be sacrificed. And they should sacrifice a human being to settle the quarrel. And they will be at peace after that. And on the market, market day, a pregnant woman, market day every five days, even to today, a, market, market, a pregnant woman came to the market to come and do normal transactions from the neighboring village. And they caught the woman and make her their object of sacrifice. We are told that while the woman was dying, she made pronouncement, unlike Stephen. God, that, that's why children, they don't offend your, offend, offend your parents. Too. When my grandma was dying, I was telling my wife, when my mother in law, I told my wife, call mama, speak to her here, and maybe can, you know, it might not talk, but I had to say something to you. Because dying people, they have words, and their word doesn't change. It's like testament. And so the woman, while she was dying, she said that this spot where they bury him, that any good coming from anywhere, we never pass through this spot. And they turned the two towns. So till today, I'm talking to you now. They're still praying to cast that demon out of that place, monitoring that cause. The town before, which was the, they are fighting, we better we practically speak the same language. The town before is very developed. Good road networks, fine town, fine place. Everything that government ever want to give to that community is stopped in that town. From this place where they I used to come, nothing good is traced up to that place till today. I'm talking to you now. They are still praying to cast away that call that man made that woman made because she made that thing out of the agony of her heart. That did not understand what Stephen did when he was praying for Paul. And that prayer worked a lot for Paul. So never underestimate the power of your voice in the love of anyone. And never estimate the, the terror of the devil. Because the devil will make sure that nothing good come out of anyone. And he knows that if you insist, that person will be good at the end of the day. What is it? May I offend you? I don't like you get offended. And you say, I was thinking this one won't be a good person. And you just abandon it. Unknown that you have missed a Stephen and you have missed a Paul. Look at Kumi, the person that I preached to him. If you have missed it, do not many people you have saved over the world. Look at that boy. Person that has preached to them. If the other person have missed them, you know how many they have saved? The devil will not make it easy for us. He lost being help, this year being empty. Awala and Igba. Are you following now? Because if this community, if we are here and this place is filled and we enter this community, one by one we win it over. 
But this darkness, you don't know you are in the midst of darkness here? Yeah? Do you know that? Where we are before, when we, know, when we are planning this place, if we are here, there was a small structure here. I was told that can you look be uh, wild wind remove the roof, even the wall we are removed. That kind of the morning wild wind remove the wall, remove everything. It won't happen again. In Jesus' name, we are not here. So if we don't pray, the devil will not want it to come in. Even if they come in, he won't want it to stay. And that's why we continue to pray for, until we get as many that God we wanted to get in their midst, in the mighty name of Jesus. Is it okay now, sir? Yes. So we should not relax and we should not give up. God will help us in Jesus' mighty name. I will bless at all. But most importantly, our self is important. Never lose out. Be convinced that you are in the right place. Not just as a church, but in Christ. That the gospel has caught up with you. It's a big privilege. It's a big privilege. Don't lose that privilege to anything. And God will help us in Jesus' mighty name. Say, Father, I will not lose out in the matter of the gospel in Jesus' mighty name. I will feel my place. No one will take my place. Nothing will drive me out of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus. I said, go now. I receive concern for this church. I receive zeal for this church. I receive grace for this church. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I don't know if you should come, either now or later. I will never regret ever being in this church. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed.